Good morning. I'll be reading from 1 Samuel chapter 17 in the NIV version, please. Now the Philistines gathered their forces for war and assembled at Soko in Judah. They pitched camp at the Ephes Demin with Soko and Azka. Saul and Israelites assembled and camped at the Valley of Eli and drew up their battle line to meet the Philistines. The Philistines occupied one hill and the Israelites another and a valley between them. A champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, came out of the Philistine camp. His height was six cubics in a span. He had a bronze helmet on his head and wore a coat of scale armor of bronze weighing 5,000 shekels. On his legs he wore bronze greaves and a bronze javelin was slung on his back. His spear was like a weaver's rod and the iron point weighed 600 shekels. His shield bearer went ahead of him. Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why do you come out and line up for battle? I am not a Philistine and you are not servants of Saul. Chose a man, or choose a man and have him come down to me. If he is able to fight and kill me, he, we will become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. Then the Philistine said, This day I defy the armies of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. On, the hearing, on hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. Now David was born a son, uh, a deaf right, named Jesse, who was from Bethlehem in Judah. Jesse had eight sons, and in Saul's time he was very old. Jesse's three oldest sons had followed Saul to the war. The firstborn was Eliab, the second was Abinadab, and the third was Shemai. David was the youngest. The three oldest followed Saul, but David went back and forth from Saul to tend his father's sheep at Bethlehem. For the forty days, the Philistine came forward every morning and evening and took his stand. Now Jesse said to his son David, Take this epitaph of roasted grain and these ten loaves of bread to your brothers and hurry to their camp. Along these ten, take along these ten cheeses to the commander of their unit. See how your brothers are and bring back some assurance from them. They are with Saul and all the men of Israel in the valley Elah, fighting against the Philistines. Early in the morning, David left the flock in the care of the shepherd, loaded up and set out. As Jesse had directed, he reached the camp as the army was going out to his battle positions, shouting their war cry. Israel and the Philistines were drawing up their lines facing each other. David left his things with the keeper of the supplies, ran to the battle, of the lines, the battle lines, and asked his brothers how they were. As he was talking with them, Goliath, the Philistine champion uh, from Gath, stepped out from his his lines and shouted out his usual, usual defiance, and David heard it. Whenever the Israelites saw the man, they all fled from him in great fear. Very good morning to each and every one of you this morning. It's so good to see a beautiful church family here this morning at Margaret Street Church of Christ. Uh, so good to be back in the pulpit after having the blessed opportunity to be able to travel. Uh, some of you might have noticed Andrew and I didn't say much about that trip before we left because the times that we did uh, the previous years, a hurricane would show up or something like that. Y'all remember when we were making all of our plans and everything kept happening? So we th thought we would just keep it quiet this time and just quietly go on the trip and everything worked out just fine. And we're so happy to be back and uh, finally feel rested. I was talking to Richard this morning and Ruth and and we're just now starting to feel a little bit normal after the jet lag and all, so it's great to be back here. One quick announcement that I do want to make, I want to remind everybody that this afternoon at 2.30, we are having a singing, our congregational-wide singing, uh, every second Sunday of the month. Uh, it's a congregational-wide singing throughout the region. 
And so this month, Margaret Street is hosting. And so we're going to be hosting uh, brethren from Scenic Hills, from uh, Jay, from different places around that are in Pace and others that will be coming and singing with us. And so we invite you to come at 2.30. It lasts for about an hour and enjoy some good fellowship with some brethren and sing with us. So please, please make your plans. Let's have a good showing uh, this afternoon at 2.30. Uh, singing here at Margaret Street. I know that you'll enjoy it. We've had about almost a hundred people when we were at Pace last time and it is just wonderful. So please, please make your plans to come. If you will, open your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 17, that passage that uh, Pat read there. And I'm trying, Miss Lori, but it doesn't seem to be wanting to cooperate. There we go. I'll just let you know next slide if you don't mind. Yes, we do have a new computer coming. We have all the new stuff coming, so just hang with us a few more weeks there. Some time ago, Joe King stood in this pulpit and he made a comment about me. He said that uh, after I had preached a sermon, he said, uh, you know, Troy hasn't repeated himself. He's been here for several years now and has not repeated himself. And he is exactly right. I, it's very rare that I ever repeat myself in preaching. I started preaching around 2004, and I have preached hundreds of sermons since then. And here in Margaret Street for five years, uh, I have consistently tried to preach a different sermon every single Sunday. Lord willing, I've got many more Sundays in me and many more hundreds of sermons left on topics that I haven't even got to yet in the Bible. But today I'm going to break that record, Joe. <laughs> today I'm going to repeat myself. And there's three reasons for that. The reasons that I want to do that is, number one, that when I preached this sermon back in 2018, well, this is a different congregation than 2018. We've got several, many new faces here, uh, new members, new brethren. Uh, sadly, we've lost several of our brethren through them going on to their reward. Uh, so it's a different congregation, almost completely, and I'm sure that those of you who were here in 2018 and heard me preach this probably can't remember the points anyway, right? And besides all that, I did change the point, so there's your second reason. It's going to be a different sermon, but next slide, please. The third reason is, is that I had the blessed opportunity to present this lesson in the very place where it took place. And so I feel motivated this morning to, to, uh, to share this with you and to, uh, to give you a, hopefully some encouraging news today from the Old Testament. Yes, we can get encouragement, we can get good news from the Old Testament, that's why God put those in there for us. And you know this story, 1 Samuel chapter 17, the story that was just read of David and Goliath. In fact, if you Google the top Bible stories of all time, David and Goliath is always in the top ten, sometimes in the top five, right behind the Passion of the Christ. That's the number one that always pops up. But everybody knows the story of David and Goliath, right? You guys know this story. You know it like the back of your hand, right? Who do, who do we have? We have the protagonist, which is Goliath, right? And Goliath is no normal soldier, right? He's this giant of a man. In fact, you know, Shaquille O'Neal is what, seven foot one, something like that. Uh, Goliath was nine foot six, approximately. So he stood way higher than, than Shaquille. He was this mammoth of a soldier, no ordinary soldier. And then on the other side of the valley, you have this young man described as ruddy. He is, he is young. He's not fully developed. Completely the opposite of Goliath. Goliath is this formidable foe, and here is David, who is just a grasshopper in his sight. He's small, and, and, and he is not your normal soldier. And you know what happens in this story. We all have read this story. But let's set the scene more properly, because I want you to see something this morning that I hope you'll take away that goes beyond that story that we all know. There's some things a lot of times that... We read in the Bible, and sometimes we just read right over it. We overread the Bible. We, we look at something, and we don't really give it much thought and just move right along. But there's significance in every single word 
that the Holy Spirit inspired. And so we need to look at that and see what it says. Those first few verses. There it says in chapter 17, Now the Philistines gathered together their armies together to battle. And were gathered together at Soko, which belongs to Judah, then encamped between Soko and Azekah in Ephes Damim. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together, and they camped in the valley of Elah and drew up the battle array against the Philistines. The Philistines stood on the mountain on one side, and the Israel's light stood on the mountain on the other side with the valley in between them. That picture you see on the screen is the valley of Elah. And so Richard and Ruth and Jack and Sherry and David and Adina Mann and Andrea and myself had the blessed opportunity to go see that valley that's still there today. 3,000 years later, it still looks the same as it did back then. There's, hills don't change, y'all. And so you can see a hill on one side and this hill on the other side. And we're standing there, in fact, where Adina is standing there in the background, that's Adina. She's standing in a dry brook, that very brook that we're going to talk about in just a second. But I want you to imagine this valley that is there, and you can see we walked out into the field, and I found it interesting that the hills are just far enough apart that if you were to draw a bow and let go of that arrow, it wouldn't make it to the other side. So each army was just out of bow and arrow distance, just out of shooting range, if you will, but yet still close enough to see each other and to taunt each other and to yell at each other. Isn't that fascinating? Two sides of God's people on one side and the Philistines on the other, and here they've come together. But here's the verse that I think we overread sometime and the focus that I want to make today. Go with me to verse 40. Verse 40. 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 40. Notice what he says here. As I said, you know the story. You know what David did. David, it says, he took his staff in his hand and he chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook and put them in a shepherd's bag in a pouch which he had and his sling was in his hand and he drew near to the Philistines. You see, that's the part we overread sometime. We were so focused on this Goliath, this giant that he is going to face, and this young man and the faith he has in God, and that is the correct focus, but we overlook little things like this verse that he chose five smooth stones. Why? The picture you see on the screen are five smooth stones that I picked up in that little brook, that little dried out creek that's there where David we we're right there in the very area where the the Israelites would have been camped and so that brook was right in front of us and I went down and yes you can still find smooth stones there's a joke that Israel trucks in smooth stones every night to replace the ones that all the tourists take and so <laughs> so we pick up five smooth stones and I have those now with me on my desk and that's a picture of them right there but why next slide why did David pick up five smooth stones. That's what I want you to focus on. I think there's a lot of spiritual application that we can take out of this. Why stones? Why smooth stones? And why five stones? Well, I want to present to you five reasons of those five stones that I think we can draw from this. First slide, or next slide rather. So why stones? Back up just one for me, if you would. There we go. Why stones? Well, there's several reasons for this. And so when we consider that they, he chose stones, you know, stone is something that is solid. It is hard. It is a mass. It, is, it represents that which is foundational, that which is sturdy, that which is stable. The picture you see there on uh, the screen is Andrew and myself standing in front of the Western Wall there in Jerusalem. Now the Western Wall, a lot of people don't understand, that's not the wall of the temple. That's simply a section of the foundation of which the temple stood. And it's called the Western Wall, that section. But it's made up of these massive, incredible stones. In fact, we looked at one they said could weigh as much as 500 tons and yet the Israelites, during the time of King Herod, they built this, this mound, this place, 
that they could put the temple on. They wanted something solid as foundation. And so they used stone. And stone has so much significance in the Bible. When you think about what, what God said to Moses in Exodus chapter 24, verse 12, the Lord said to Moses, Come up to the mountain and be there, and I will give you tablets on stone whenever he gave him the Ten Commandments. We consider what is said in Isaiah, Behold, I lay in Zion a stone for a foundation, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone. Well, Peter goes on to explain that in a lot more detail in 1 Peter chapter 2, when he says that we are living stones, and that we are being built up in the spiritual house, a holy priesthood. And he goes on to say, and Christ is that chief cornerstone. We consider also what the psalmist says in Psalm 18, that he is our rock, that the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer and my strength in whom I will trust. A stone, a rock is something that is solid, it is foundational, it is unchanging. Next slide. And so what's the application that we can take from that? Is that God wants you to be solid, to be unwavering, to be standing firm in your faith like a stone. That's what we can draw from this. We, got, we need to be like David. We need to be unwavering, and, and he's in the Bible as an example to us to teach us that we too need to be solid on our faith. In fact, what did Jesus say in Matthew chapter 7, 24? He says, he says, therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to the man who builds his house upon the what? The rock. We need to be like that. That's what God expects of us. So why stones? Did David have a strong, solid hope? Oh, yes, he did. And I see that right there in the very stones that he drew from that brook, right there in the middle of the Valley of Elah. Next slide and the next point. Why stones? Well, despite the confidence that David had in God, you know, Saul didn't have so much confidence. If you back up there in our passage we were looking in chapter 17, look in verse 38. So when David comes down into the valley and greets his brothers and he hears that Philistine blaspheming God, and he's looking around saying, what's wrong with you people? Why are you all allowing him to do this? And everybody was afraid and David volunteers. Well, Saul, look what he does in verse 38. He says, he clothed David with his armor and put a bronze helmet on his head. He also clothed him with a coat of mail, and David fastened his sword to his armor, and he tried to walk, for he had not tested them. And David said to Saul, I cannot walk with these, for I have not tested them. So David took them off. You know, when you think about military, when you think about armies that line up against each other, it, you want to have armor and weapons and, and things like that. It is, it's so sad but it is rather impressive, man's ability to kill another man these days. The efficiency, the proficiency, the preciseness of it, the everything that we have, this technology that we have. Have you ever looked at the technology that, that armies have today, especially the United States? A modern day soldier is incredible, y'all. You know, the Philistines were like that. In that day and age, the Philistines, they were the high tech. They had weapons that were far more high tech than anything Israel had. In fact, if you back up in 1 Samuel chapter 13, in 13 verse 19, it says, Now there was no blacksmith to be found throughout all the land of Israel, for the Philistines said, lest the Hebrews make swords or spears. You see, the Philistines, they had the high tech weaponry. They had the military a technology that was going to be able to prevail against the Israelites. The Israelites were lacking. And yet, despite all that, David rejects that armor. He rejects that technology. And he picks up one of the most primitive weapons in all the earth. Instead of using that military tech that was available to him, he took what God provided him. And there is a lesson in there. Next slide. And the fact is, because a stone is a special kind of weapon, it is God's creation. And you know the story. It was God's creation that overcame man's 
creation. Man created this weaponry, but God's creation is the one that prevailed and the one that won. And when he slung that stone and that giant fell, David was committed. He was dedicated to God. He relied more on God and what God provided than what Saul could provide in that armor. There's such a beautiful lesson in there for us. Next slide. The fact that we need to be like David. We need to be more like David. We should rely on the tools and the weapons that God has provided for the battle that we are in instead of trying to rely on our own devices. Go and read Ephesians chapter 6. It says we don't fight, we don't battle against these, these earthly things. We are in a battle that is spiritual. And God has provided weaponry. And God has provided all the things and the, the, the protection and the armor that we need to prevail. We just need to lean upon Him. Just like David did. David chose to use God's provision. A third point, a third stone, if you will. Next slide. Why smooth stones? Have you ever thought about that? Why smooth stones? Well, in the middle of that valley that we showed you there, in the Eli Valley, is that brook, and it's dry most of the time. But just like in all places in Israel, when it rains, then all those brooks, all those rivers, all those wadis fill up with water, and the water rolls across them. And what you typically see in a river or a brook are stones that are smooth. Now, if you stop and think about a stone, what is a stone? A stone is a, a rock that's been broken off from a larger rock, and it's usually jagged. It has sharp edges. In fact, right here in America, our Native Americans would take different kinds of rocks. They would make them even sharper. For centuries, for millennia, you have all kinds of of People that would take, and cultures that would take rocks and make them sharp and use them for knives. So why didn't David grab a sharp rock so he could cut Goliath? After all, Goliath had a sword, right? Well, David didn't choose a sharp, jagged stone because that wasn't in his skill set. But there's also an application there. How does a sharp, jagged stone become smooth? Well, it becomes smooth when that water is constantly running across it. When that water is wearing down those edges, and there is an application for us. Next slide. And that is that those jagged edges need to come off. When a Christian is converted, when they come to the foot of the cross, they have come out of a, an ungodly life, and they have rough, jagged edges. They've been broken off. They're a broken off piece of something that's larger than themselves. And they can't get through life as easily because there's resistance through that. And so a Christian, on the other hand, becomes a smooth stone. Next slide. Whenever the living water of Jesus wears down those edges. And over time, at first, it's abrasive, and at first, it's not very, it's not very uh, acceptable or very, uh, very comfortable. But over time, as a Christian matures and those edges get smoother and softer, you can see it in a more mature Christian. And you stop and think about what Isaiah says in Isaiah chapter 64, verse 8. He says, Oh Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay, and you are the potter. It's the same principle. We could continue with Romans chapter 12 that talks about the fact that we're supposed to be con not conformed to this world, but we're supposed to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. That's that molding, that's that smoothing off those, those rough edges. James chapter 1 verse 2 through 4 that talks about let us count on all joy when we fall into diverse temptations, that it produces patience. That's that living water that is smoothing off those hard, jagged edges that we come to the foot of the cross with. There is application there. But then there's another one. Next slide. He chose smooth stones because a smooth stone, a crooked, jagged stone, there we go, a crooked, jagged stone is not aerodynamic. It doesn't fly straight, and it won't go the distance. You think about it, it's not aerodynamic, and so it's, if it's crooked and jagged, it's, it's not going to fly in the right direction. It's going to veer off course. It's not going to go the distance. It's not going to hit 
its mark. And isn't that what we're supposed to be trying to do? Now we talk about the definition of sin. What is sin? Sin is not hitting the mark, right? What do we want to do? We want to hit the mark. What is our mark? Our mark is heaven. Our mark is that eternal life. And so next slide, when you think about do we need to be like a smooth stone? Yes, we need to be like that smooth stone that flies straight, that goes the distance and hits our mark. You think about Proverbs chapter 14, verse 2, that talks about the fact that there is a way which seems right to man, but in the end, the way is death. Revelation chapter 2, verse 10, that talks about the fact that we need to remain faithful until death. This is the only way that you're going to hit the mark. You come to Jesus. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And so we need to be that smooth stone. And then last but not least, that fifth stone or the fifth point. Next slide. Why five stones? Well, the text says that he drew five stones. Why didn't he pick two or ten or twenty? Why five? There's all kinds of speculation that commentators like to use. They like to say things like, well, there was doubt. And so therefore he took more than he needed. Others like to say, well, no, it's because Goliath had four brothers. And so once he took out Goliath, he had to be prepared for the four brothers. I don't believe any of that. I don't think it matters how many stones he took. However, what soldier goes into battle with one bullet, <laughs> right? Sometimes it's the ammunition that wins the battle. And so David was simply being prepared. That's all it was. David was confident and therefore he was being prepared. But did it really matter how many he picked up? Not really. Next slide. Because... In reality, what David was more confident in was the power behind the stone. With that kind of power, he had no fear. No fear. And so we come to the climax of the story when we read it. Whenever he picks up that stone and, and he goes out to him, and notice he takes that stone. He takes, as we go back to our points, whenever... The Philistine was yelling at him. In verse 45, David said to the Philistine, You come at me with a sword, with a spear, and with a javelin. And I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel whom you have defiled. And then it says that this day the Lord will deliver you into my hand and I will strike you and take your head from you. And I can just see this, this giant standing there going, What? Here's a seasoned, battled soldier and a little boy. He even calls him a dog. And yet David put his hand in his bag, verse 49. He took out a stone and he slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead so that the stone sank into his forehead and he fell on his face on the earth. You know, those little stones that I picked up that you see there on the screen, they're not very big. But you know what they are? They're, they're bigger than the size of a 45 caliber. <laughs> You know, a 45 caliber will drop somebody in a heartbeat. But it wasn't the sling. It wasn't David. And it wasn't even the stone. It was God. God is the one that provided that. It wouldn't matter if David had a thousand stones, if he had a machine gun, if he had a bomb or a Death Star laser. God provided the power. And that's the lesson for us. He believed in God. Now, we believe in God. We've talked about the power that's behind that. But we have even more. God has provided even more for us. Next slide. Whenever we consider what God has done for us, we have five smooth stones also. We have that first stone, which is God. As we talked about God, who is our rock and our fortress, He is going to win. Listen, it, just read the book of Revelation. Spoiler alert, God wins. Read the book of Daniel. Guess what? God's in control. We have God just like David had God. But we also have Jesus. David didn't have Jesus. What did Jesus do? Jesus conquered death. And therefore, we can put our trust in Him, that He indeed is that chief cornerstone. And then we have the Holy Spirit, 
The Holy Spirit that provided this Bible for us. And whenever uh, Philippians chapter 1 talks about, For I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayer supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. And he goes on to say, Take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit. We have the Spirit with us. We have the Bible, which is that fourth stone. We can take this, and it's called that sword that we can use to fight that spiritual enemy, that same thing that Jesus did whenever he was attacked by the spiritual being, Satan. What did he say each time? It is written. We have God, we have Jesus, we have the Holy Spirit, we have the Bible, and we have the church. There's five stones because Jesus said the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Five stones in our own bag that we can use to defeat the enemy. You know, David came onto that field that day, recognizing something that all the rest of those people had forgotten. That with God on our side, who can be against us? God will provide what we need. And so what about you, friend? Are you a rough, jagged stone this morning? Well, I hope that this has encouraged you to think about your life and that God wants you to be with Him in heaven. God provided His Son, Jesus, so that you can have a means to get back into a relationship with Him, so that you can be with Him in heaven. And it involves believing in that Son, believing in Him and then repenting of your sin. Stop doing those things that are contrary to the will of God, those jagged things, and become that smooth stone. And then confess his name and then be baptized. You do those things and he puts you into the church, Acts 2 verse 47, and you'll have that protection. Those five stones that we talked about. That's five things that protect you. Have you done that? If not, why not? We're going to sing this song of invitation. If we can help you in any way, please let it be known as together we stand and sing. Will you come?